Good evening. What a beautiful evening and the sun is shining. Um, my name is Susie Hudson. I'm the executive director here at White Bear Center for the Arts. And the Right Now contest and the award ceremony is one of the best nights out of the year. I've been here for 18 years, so this is the 18th one of these I have the honor of being a part of. Um, writing is a very lonely, sometimes, you know, isolated experience. Um, as our former board chair, Robbie Johnson, who also taught English for many, many years in the um, Matamidi school system, she always said when she was in this role at the Writers' Contest how, how much our kids are celebrated through their accomplishments in the sports, in the arenas. We have cheering, we have all kinds of acknowledgement for those more outward facing experiences and accomplishments. But as a young writer, we rarely get a chance to be recognized and celebrated. So congratulations to each and every one of you who have not only um, been recognized for your writing, but also those of you who maybe weren't um, awarded a special recognition tonight, but are equally as celebrated here tonight for all of your efforts, putting your heart and thoughts and words onto paper, or I guess that's old school now, but um, out there for others to um, receive. It's truly a gift to the world. It's a, a gift to everybody who gets to um, get a little window into your, your thoughts and imagination and hearts and values. So thank you so very much for being here tonight, for putting yourself out there. Congratulations. Um, and I hope you have uh, a bright and wonderful future in writing. My, um, my dad, who just passed away in January, was a man of words. And he was a minister and um, faced a podium like this. And my mom and I spent several uh, nights recently reading through his old letters. And one of his big fears was always having to come to the, um, the pulpit with words to share and to guide. Um, when I asked my mom if she, who she's now 88, I asked her if she had anything that she wished she had done more of. And to my surprise, she said, I wish I had written more. So don't let that be a regret. You have a gift to share and you're young. And please always honor that gift and share it and celebrate that part that is um, unique to you. So with that, it's my honor to introduce Karen Parkman, who is our outreach coordinator and has um, really guided this contest uh, to our schools and to each and every one of you. Thank you for responding to our call for entries. Um, welcome to all of you to the 2022 Right Now High School Writing Contest Awards Ceremony. Um, I am very misty-eyed seeing such a full house of people coming out to celebrate student writing. So thank you for being here and spending your evening with us. It's very moving to see all of this support um, and all of this appreciation in the room tonight. So thanks for being here. Um, so welcome to White Bear Center for the Arts. WBCA is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to enrich lives by celebrating art, nourish imagination by inspiring creativity, and build understanding by connecting people. And I think that writing accomplishes all those goals as well. And I think that the submissions we received this year and the award-winning work that we honored this year all um, accomplish those goals as well. A little bit about the contest, if you're unfamiliar. The Right Now contest is open to all high school students in the Northeast metro area, and the contest judges are professional authors, writers, and educators um, from our communities. 
And WDCA has hosted this contest for nearly 40 years now. So all of you who have participated are part of a very long and venerable tradition of celebrating student work and creativity. So thank you for being a part of this. And this year was especially exciting. We had students from 12 different schools participate, which is a record for us. Um, so we're really seeing tonight the um, wealth of talent of young writers in our community being represented. Um, and we're so privileged to have the chance to read and honor your work. Um, so before we get started, we have a few amazing supporters to thank. So first, a very special thank you to the judges and the school coordinators. This contest would not be possible without them, so we are very grateful that they were a part of it. Um, and you can look at the printed program for a full list of their names as well, and I encourage you to do so. Um, and I want to say thank you as well to all of the students who participated this year, regardless of outcome. Um, this has not been an easy couple of years to be a student or a person, but I think a student especially. Um, so I just want to say how inspirational your resilience and your creative spirit is um, and how much it means to us that you shared your work at this contest. Um, we also would like to thank our premier business sponsors. I always have to prepare for this list. So, okay. Boyum Baronshear, Emergency Contractors Services Incorporated, Griner Construction, JL Schweders Building Supple Construction Incorporated, Mueller Memorial, New Studio Architecture, Schweders Pottery, Stonehouse Catering, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars Keep Zimmer Post, number 1782, uh, and Excel Energy Foundation. Um, and you can visit the White Bear Center for the Arts website for a full list of our business sponsors. This activity is also made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota States Arts Board operating support grant, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. I think that's the first time I've done that without tripping over the words, so I think I'm getting better at this. Um, and this activity is also made part, uh, possible as well, in part by the Manitou Fund. So thank you to all of those supporters. Um, they really made this night possible. So we have an amazing program coming up, um, a little preview of the night so everybody feels prepared. Um, we'll be announcing all the winners by category, starting with poetry and then going through each one. Each student is invited to the stage to receive their awards. So when I call your name, you can make your way up to the stage um, to get your certificate and prize. Um, you can really use either stair I think this feels like a good flow, personally. Um, but do just keep an eye out for that. Um, there's a cord down there, and just, you know, if you need to steady yourself on the wall going up the stairs. I wore my chunky boots today, and I had a hard time getting up there. So just give me a wave if you need a hand. Um, and all the Award of Excellence winners are invited to read their, uh, from their work tonight. And lucky for us, some of them have agreed to do so. Um, so um, when I call your name, if you're an Award of Excellence winner, please make your way to the podium. I have printouts of your work if you need them, and you can read your work before accepting your award. Any questions? Makes sense? Well, let's get started. I'm ready to like applaud. Let's, let's do this. Um, so we're going to start with poetry today, um, and we are very lucky to have one of our poetry judges here who offered to say a few words. Um, Marianne Monk, um, our poetry judge, thank you so much for being here, and please join me in welcoming her to the stage to start off the poetry section. Remarks are here. <laughs> so. How's that? Okay. Well, thank you to White Bear Center for the Arts for sponsoring this contest um, for so many wonderful, wonderful years. And um, thanks to all of you for being here. And congratulations to the writers for a job well done on their submissions to the contest. It was a pleasure to judge the poems. 
and I'm looking forward to hearing some outstanding work tonight from everyone. Um, one of the greatest gifts of writing is being able to tell your truth. Many years ago, I had a writing pal who was taking a writing class from a teacher who was very early in her career. And my friend submitted a poem for critique. And his first line of that poem was, August comes on like piranhas. The critique from the teacher came back saying, August is singular, therefore vicious little fish must also be singular, so August comes on like a piranha. She was correct. Grammatically, that's right. But my friend was telling his truth. He was a single dad with four kids, ages four through high school. The poem went on to convey a month of preparation for the start of school, buying school supplies and clothes, doctor visits, dealing with an ex-wife who wasn't exactly helpful, car broken down. You get it. Piranhas, a whole swarm of them fighting everywhere. I sided with my friend. The teacher was correct, but she was wrong. August, for my friend, came on like piranhas, plural. And he let that first line of that poem stand. By the way, that teacher later changed her methods and became one of the most beloved members of the writing community in the Twin Cities. So she learned. Um, but ultimately, what goes into your writing is your decision. Grammar is important and it's helpful. It helps convey what you really want to say. But always, I urge you, please, first and foremost, say your truth. That applies to fiction, too. Is there a mouse in the wall? Or is there a scurrying sound that you can't identify that gives you the creeps and keeps you up all night? You get to decide. Maybe it turns out it's a chipmunk. But you get to choose your truth and how you tell it, straight or slant. Choose wisely. Say what you really mean. Truth belongs to you and it's yours to share. Sending it out into the world will very likely help others. So do your best, keep on writing. Thank you. Um, another poetry by uh, Judge Ann Picard is here tonight as well. Ann, did you want to say a few words? Beautiful. So please welcome Ann Picard to the stage. I will be quite brief, but I did want to say something. I really did. I treasured being a judge. I heard many voices and I really could appreciate what they were saying. So I wrote it down just to be sure I don't go off topic or talk too much. We need, we are living in a very complicated time and we need their voices. We need all the voices of the young that are learning about their dreams and their gifts that they are meant to give us. And I, I treasured being a judge for that reason to be able to hear them. So I'm pleading with you as writers, keep writing. We need you. I saw in the writing lots of desires, desires for a culture of peace, a culture of justice. Um, I couldn't help but just treasure each person that I read their work, realizing that this was a talented student who was speaking from her heart. And that's what we need. She spoke of truth. I agree with that totally. And I think we do need to speak from our heart. And I also wanted to congratulate the teachers involved. 
thank goodness that we have teachers willing to encourage and, and, and be inspired and in listening to your voices. We really need your voices. Keep writing. And I believe, um, I also am going to sound a little philosophical, but I would love if you could learn during these years of education to love yourself and all the individual gifts that are within you and then be willing to share those gifts with a world that needs you because you speak from your heart and that isn't very true in lots of situations and I could go on and on about that one that's all I need to say and I congratulate again the teachers involved and I congratulate all the students that shared their hearts in their writing. I really appreciate being part of it. Thank you. Thank you Anne and Marianne. Um, so let's hand out some awards shall we? So we're going to begin with the poetry category. Um, Lori Swanson, our development coordinator, will be up on stage. And um, when you come to the stage, she will have the envelope with your prize in it. And um, yeah, if those stairs are too titchy, just, you can just stick with these ones, whatever you all need. So let's get started with poetry. We're going to start with the um, grades 9 through 10. So we will begin with our first prize which is the honorable mention in the poetry category for grades 9 and 10. Please welcome the, to the stage Matthew Brown for A Father's Legacy. Um, we'll continue with the... was bound to happen. All right, we will continue with the Award of Merit. Um, this writer, I believe, is not with us tonight. Uh, Ariana Van Cook, raise your hand if you are here. Okay. Well, I would love to send a big, warm round of applause to Ariana Van Cook for the poem Monochromatic. Sometimes you can feel those things from far away, so hopefully that, that reached the student. Um, and uh, we are also going, we're going to end um, the, this category with our Award of Excellence winner. Um, I do want to apologize, the name in the program is not correct. Um, so please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our Award of Excellence winner, Zawa Carney, for The Clock Strikes Nine. My poem is called When the Clock Strikes Nine. Struck. <laughs> Take goes the clock, keeping the time. But my time will stop when the clock strikes nine. When I am gone, no one will care. Because to them, I was never really there. No one will cry, but that's fair. Because to them, I'll be out of their hair. But then I think of my real friends. How will they feel when my time ends? I start thinking, and then some more. And next thing I know, I'm on the floor crying and weeping because I am sad. I almost left all the good things I still had. There are people that love me. I now know it's true. If I ask for help, those people come through. With their love, I'll guess I'll be fine because nothing happened when the clock struck nine. Now with help, I'm better than I've been because I'm still here as the clock strikes 10. All right. <laughs> I know, we may be putting in an order for some new ones. Um, we will continue on with grades 11 and 12 in the poetry category. Please join me in applauding for our honorable mention, Zoe Rutger for Baby Fat.
And for the Award of Merit, Poetry, grades 11 and 12, Caitlin Eigel, your future roommate. And a very warm round of applause for the winner of the Award of Excellence in this category, Anya Krasowska, Elegy to My Rationality on Holiday. Hi, I'm Anya Krasowska, and my poem is called An Elegy to My Rationality on Holiday. What does bulimia explain about me? It's plastered below my name like I've been knighted. Why do I search for wisdom in that diagnosis? It doesn't tell me why my brain can't stand the idea of being full, or why I spend half my days worrying about the calories for my next meal and the fat content of my next. I learned to worship at the Port Sun altar, and my knees bruised from the tile. And I know my diagnosis is a guidebook for doctors to help, but I can't read it. All I want is to be able to look at that chicken scratch and understand, because I tried to control something and it just ended up controlling me. It pegged a bag for my rationality and sent her on holiday, but I can't seem to find her. So I search and search, but my illness has sucked the life out of my searching. And with this, I learn a name is not all you need to vanquish a monster. Thank you so much to our poetry uh, winners and readers. Uh, we'll continue with the creative nonfiction category. So unfortunately, um, uh, one of the judges who would love to have spoken couldn't be here. Um, he is out of town. Um, but I wanted to read uh, a brief message from Steve Robert Simmons, a creative nonfiction judge. He says, it was a pleasure to once again read your writings submitted within the creative nonfiction category. I was especially impressed by your honesty in addressing your various subjects. I trust that regardless of how the contest went for you individually, that you found this type of writing to be insightful at a personal level. One of the best descriptions I've heard for how this kind of writing goes, uh, goes something like this. I don't write about what I know, but to find out what I know. May it be so for each of you as you go forth from this point in your writing life. So thank you to, to Steve for adding that. So uh, we'll begin with grades nine and 10 in the creative nonfiction category. Honorable mention, please welcome to the stage Hannah Johnson for Drowning in Competition. Oh wait, Hannah's not here, but I have to trust that that, that, that reached them. Um, we'll continue with Award of Merit. Um, I'm actually, is Olivia Carl here? Raise your hand, Olivia. Okay, well again, we're just gonna send all the good energy to Olivia Carl for Little Person Big Moment. And we were uh, very lucky to have a wealth of amazing writing, really in all the categories, but um, uh, it shows up especially in creative nonfiction because we had two awards of excellence um, in grades nine and 10 in this category. So the first is for a student who can't, couldn't make it today. So a quick round of applause, please, for Ariana Van Cook for Because of Gramps. Lucky for us, the other winner is here tonight. Uh, please join me in congratulating Caitlin Berkland for Shaking with Fear. So much, Caitlin. All right, and for grades 11 and 12, we'll start um, with the award of merit. 
Uh, that goes to Jennifer Page for Awfully Funny for an Introvert. Thank you, Jennifer. And a hearty round of applause for the Award of Excellence winner, Alexa Atkinson, for Instinct. Okay, so my piece is called Instinct. It wasn't the fact that I couldn't be saved, but the fact that nobody wanted to save each other. It was February 2020, before the pandemic even occurred. There were no masks, just giggly students creating memories at their Silver Bell Winter Formal. Unfortunately, the dreamy pursuits at the Mall of America didn't exactly go as planned. What was the plan, you may ask? Well, since everyone was dressed up for a formal dance, each student had brought a change of clothes for the second portion of the evening the amusement park rides. This consisted of roller coasters, adrenaline highs, students having a reason to hold on to their dates, and loud prompted screaming. After the first part of the dance concluded, it was time to change. Easy enough, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, the illusion of convenience fizzled out as everyone transitioned from the dance to the amusement park. That night, Panic echoed around a single coat room as young manicured hands reached for their belongings. That night, a hierarchy was formed, and me being an underclassman, I was mercilessly pushed to the bottom. That night, I was a helpless freshman in a hot, sweat-filled tsunami of well-dressed high schoolers. It was blatant that in a matter of minutes, everyone was standing by their newly found motto, only I matter. Everyone's slowly moving bodies eagerly pushed towards the coat room, we all just wanted to collect our things and enjoy the rest of our night. But at an instant, dozens of limbs decorated in shining jewelry and expensive watches were stacked up on, on top of one another. Blurred colors with textures of lace and silk violently swept past me. I was caught within the elegant rainbow. The weight of unfamiliar hands rested on my shoulders. Black, uh, blank redded faces respired on my neck and next to my ear. The hot moisture of everyone's thick, gasping breaths was so heavy that it gathered on my skin like condensation on a window. The overwhelming smothering made my brain race. How do I escape? I became increasingly discontented with the position of being a human lifesaver. People I barely knew leaned harder and harder into me. That's it. I'm done with this. With all the strength I could muster, I shook the strangers off my sore shoulders and waded through the panicked crowd. At first, I attempted to be polite excusing myself to reach inside the coat room. My polite demeanor was ungenerously rewarded with my body being harshly shoved into a group of tight-knit people. At this point, I had no control over my body. There were too many people, so much heat, and enough panic to swallow me whole. Another sudden shove from behind resulted in a small yelp escaping my lips. My heels had lost their grip on the smooth concrete and began to skitter across the floor. I instinctively grabbed onto the back of a boy's white dress shirt, attempting not to fall into my face and worsen the situation. I tried to curl up into an invisible shell as he looked over his shoulder. His face was contorted into a confused expression. I am so sorry. My gasp loosened as I, as I gained my balance. I felt my cheeks burn in embarrassment. He shrugged and his lips moved, but I had no idea what he said. My ears were ringing from the astronomical amount of noise that this human stampede had created. At this point, an unbearable swarm of heat encapsulated my body. It seeped into my lungs and made my eyes water. I was beginning to feel faint. I had been planning to get some water after I got my belongings, but I was trapped within human walls. My peripheral vision caught flashing lights above me. I squinted at the staircase that wrapped around the coat room, just as packed with students as it was on the floor below. Vertically held phones, tilted towards the scene, were recording every second of our distress. I could only imagine how much footage was broadcasted, swirling in Matamudai's social media circuit. I heard angry and concerned muttering behind me. I took a quick but stiff glance over my shoulder to see a girl clinging to her friend. The dresses meshed together as the girl's grasp on her friend tightened. She needs her insulin. It is in the coat room. Please, make a path. Nobody budged. 
I attempted to, but there wasn't a place to move into. I angrily sighed. This girl was possibly going into diabetic shock, and nobody blinked an eye. What was wrong with all of us? The boy in the white dress shirt looked back at me again. I avoided eye contact, for it was already awkward enough that I was being repeatedly shoved against him. What did she say? He asked me as he scanned the scene behind us. They said she needs her insulin. My voice faded, expecting him to just take the information and continue to ignore me. Hey, are you okay? He asked, shifting the slightest bit closer to me. My brow furrowed. I wasn't used to getting questions about my well-being from strangers. I'm fine, I softly replied. The body tsunami pushed us together once again. I awkwardly laughed in response and looked down at my bejeweled heels. When I looked back up at him again, his eyes were still locked on me. You should try to get out of here. Your face is really red, he expressed, seeming genuinely concerned. My hands shot up to feel my cheeks. They were scalding. It also occurred to me that the tips of my ears had begun to burn, which happens when I overheat. You're right, I looked around comedically and laughed, but I can't get out. Nobody's moving. My politeness withered away as I pushed a person who was attempting to propel past us. At that moment, an authoritative boom echoed over our heads. Everyone jumped, a few girls screamed, and their dates began to mock them. Everyone, clear the area. You can get your stuff later, just clear the area. I tried to glance over the crowd to see the savior of the night. It was one of the science teachers. The other chaperones eventually caught on and ushered the students away from around the coat room. Everyone willingly dispersed and then regrouped into their cliques, wasting no time telling their heroic stories of surviving the Silver Bell stampede. I pushed my way through the sweaty mass of people, hands reaching for the less populated areas. When I finally found a less crowded space, my skin drank the cold air and attempted to regulate its temperature again. I took a large breath and sat on the dusty floor. I didn't know where my friends were. They could have been anywhere. But I was just appreciating being able to breathe in normal oxygen without the reeking stench of BO and cheap perfume. I looked around again at my peers. It was funny seeing everyone being dramatic at one moment and then acting strongly in the next. Some of the boys stood up tall as they further escorted their dates from the chaos, telling them the tales of how they held up in such conditions. Others waved their hands in the air, gesturing their crazy story. They looked ridiculous, but I can't judge. I mean, I'm writing an official account for my English narrative. <laughs> I thought it was funny because at the time I was thinking about the movie Titanic. The climax where everyone is screaming and attempting to get into the few lifeboats available was eerily similar to the crazy debacle that I just described. In all fairness, my words don't even do it justice. It was horrible. Anyways, as I sat on the floor, completely defeated, I came to an honestly awful conclusion. For when push comes to shove, nobody's going to be your friend. The people that you walk alongside every day are only going to help themselves. Except for that one nice guy in the white dress shirt. I wish I could have thanked him, but I never saw him again after that night. But who knows, maybe one day I'll run into my Jack Dawson again. Thank you so much, Alexa. Our next category. <laughs> Our next category is persuasive essay, um, and we have a message from one of the judges, Julie Lundgren, who unfortunately couldn't be here but wanted to say a few words. She says, "Congratulations to all participants on a job well done. Writing is a discipline and an art. Finding the perfect words to express your thoughts, imagination, and logic has powerful sway." Sharing those words unleashes that power and is an act of courage. Keep writing. Um, I personally love this category because I get to see um, insight into, sorry, this is me, not Julie now. Um, I love this category because I get to see a little insight into what students really care about. Um, and it turns out that they care a lot and they care about things that really matter. And I always find when I read those submissions that the world is in good hands with the next generation. So I am excited to honor the students in this category. We'll begin with um, grades 9 and 10 with the Award of Merit. Um, that, uh, is Mary Kate here? Give her the hand if you are here. Okay. Well, we'll give a big round of applause, please, to Mary Kate Grills for our community's environmental responsibilities.
And the award of excellence for this grade group and category goes to Elizabeth Burns for the gender pay gap in sports. Compared to men, women have been at a systemic disadvantage in sports for most of history. Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the first modern Olympic Games, commented that the inclusion of women would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. The first modern Olympic Games were held in 1896, with women first being allowed to participate in 1900. Out of almost 1,000 athletes, there were only 22 women competing. In this cycle and other early cycles of the modern Olympic Games, Women primarily stuck to disciplines that were viewed as feminine. These disciplines include sports such as tennis, croquet, golf, sailing, and figure skating. It was not until this past year's Summer Olympics in Tokyo that 49% of the athletes competing were female. It took more than a century to level the number of women and men participating, and men's athletic competitions still enjoy an advantage when it comes to both the payroll and in the media. While many historical barriers to women's participation and success in sports have been removed, current barriers and attitudes persist. During the 2021 March Madness Basketball Tournament, the quality of the men's and women's facilities was shockingly dissimilar. Many female basketball players and coaches present at the tournament took to social media to shed light on the injustices present at one of the biggest stages in basketball. Side-by-side -side comparisons of facilities for men and women reveal the superior weight training facilities, gift bags, and food to which male athletes have access. When discussing the weightlifting facilities at the tournament venue, Sedona Prince of the Oregon Ducks women's basketball team said, there's a big conception that women don't need to lift weights. It is appalling that an organization committed to the well-being and lifelong success of athletes does not have the appropriate equipment for women. When women do win hard-fought battles for increased battles in sports, the benefits are often not enough. In early 2020, the WNBA and the WNBA Players Association agreed to an eight-year collective bargaining agreement. The agreement gives players access to fully paid maternity leave, enhanced travel plans, including individual hotel rooms, and better seating on airplanes while traveling, and a greater share of the league's revenue. When the CBA was announced, the WNBA purported it to be an innovative, revolutionary win for professional female basketball players but the CBA was earned only after players and their needs were ignored for years. It is contemptible that women are unable to achieve their earning and athletic potential in the highest levels of sport due to flagrant discrimination. Professional female athletes are subject to the, women's, to the media's limited and abrasive coverage of women's sports. Since 1989, every five years, a University of Southern California study concerning men's and women's sports news coverage has been conducted. Each segment of the study has revealed similarly low percentages of airtime focused on women's sports. The 2021 installment of the study was no different, finding that 95% of total television coverage on ESPN in 2019 was on men's sports news. The study also found that when women's sports news are covered, the coverage tends to be both lower in technical and production quality compared to coverage of men's sports. Airtimes tends to center around negative elements of women's sports, such as fighting. It ignores not only the impressive athleticism and skill involved in women's sports, but also the activism in which these athletes are involved. The amount of coverage, the refinement of that coverage, and the topics presented are troubling. Those who may be interested in women's sports may quit taking heed of developments simply because the content is tedious and dull. Fewer people watching, listening to, and reading content put up by the media leads corporations to believe that there is apathy for women's sports. Women's sports are not repetitive and lackluster. They simply have never been given a fair chance by the corporations that determine what is worth paying attention to. So when institutions give the same priority to women's sports that they do to men's sports, generations of young girls will be able to pursue their ambitions with confidence. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, all right, we will move on to the grades 11 and 10, uh, sorry, 11 and 12 um, in this category. 
The Award of Merit goes to Caitlin Eigel for Space Humans. And the Award of Excellence, please join me in congratulating Kaya Ramali for the Disparities for Black Women in Healthcare. For most of us, going to the hospital or to the doctor is not an anxiety-ridden event. The majority of us don't have to worry whether the doctor will treat us fairly or whether we will leave with more health issues than we came in with. What goes unseen is that this is the reality for millions of black women. Black women face disparities in health care that white women do not. According to Harvard Health, black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women and almost two times as likely to experience infertility. Along with childbirth, researchers from the Endometriosis Foundation estimate that nearly a quarter of all black women ages 18 to 30 have uterine fibroids, compared with 7% of white women. So why is this happening? The simple answer is discrimination. But it is more complex than that. As stated in the New York Times, the dangers black women face in pregnancy and childbirth are compounded by racism, unconscious biases in healthcare, and the long-term anxieties that come with being an African-American woman. The day-to-day -day racism that black women face can take a toll on their health. Research by a professor of social epidemiology has discovered that early life exposure to Jim Crow laws can cause negative health effects decades later. The idea of weathering explains that high levels of chronic stress can induce health issues, and premature aging. Other more current forms of discrimination, such as predominantly black neighborhoods having higher levels of air pollution, fewer supermarkets than other neighborhoods, and a lack of access to medical specialists can further advance inequities and health issues for black women. Not only does discrimination affect black women's health in their everyday lives, but also inside medical institutions. Even the wealthiest and most successful black women, such as Serena Williams, can escape this occurrence. According to the New York Times, after giving birth, Ms. Williams alerted the doctor that she suspected she was having a certain health complication that she was familiar with. The doctor wrongly responded by saying she was just confused. This is a common event for black women and leads to further stigmatization. Lack of research in clinical trials regarding black women creates further issues. Health conditions that disproportionately impact black women, such as uterine fibroids, receive very little government research funding. Without proper research, common health issues for black women will never be resolved. Although this all seems daunting, there are certain steps we can take to combat these concerns. Things like mandating anti-racism training for healthcare professionals and dedicating more money for research regarding black women are small steps that will expedite a better future. No one deserves to fear the doctor's office, and it is our responsibility to make that a reality. Thank you, Kaya. All right, the next category is short story. Um, I have a quick word about this category. Um, it's very dear to my heart. I'm a I love all the categories, and they all really um, mean a lot to me, but um, uh, I, I always look forward to the fiction category. Um, and I think that's in part because fiction places us into points of view that we might otherwise not have had the opportunity to experience. And that act, I believe, requires an incredible amount of compassion on both the part of the reader, but also the writer. And uh, that creative compassion and bravery was on full display in this year's fiction writers. Um, so thanks to all of them for submitting. Your stories bring us into possible futures and relationships we might never have encountered, and they did so with skill and confidence. So thank you for bringing us into these worlds that you created. So we'll begin with the grade 9 and 10 um, section. Uh, so the award of merit for the short story category goes to Josiah Wass for The Smoke of Memory.
Thanks, Josiah. Um, and the Award of Excellence in grades 9 and 10. Please join me in congratulating Cynthia Meisinger with Letters with Locks. Can you everyone hear me a lot? Good? Okay. As you know, my story is called Letter with the Fox, and I'll start right now. Charlotte adjusted the strap of her purse hesitantly. She felt the wind blow gently through her hair as she looked at the antique store Jamie had brought her to. At least, she felt as if she was looking up. Antique stores had that kind of power. Old things brought into the lives of new people, old stories merging with modern, but just as soon as the power of the store washed over her, it retreated like the water on the shore of the sea. And she followed with a laugh as Jamie excitedly pulled her hand, practically dragging her into the store. Today was their last day of summer vacation together. Jamie's family was leaving for their house in Florida for the summer, leaving her alone in homely Minnesota. Jamie had promised to make today special, and so far he had succeeded. He practically bounced around the antique store, Charlotte, on the other hand, slowly worked her way through the store, her fingers lingering on long-forgotten objects that she believed were once held dearly by someone now wrinkled and gray. A wistful smile made its way onto her face, and she looked at an old and cracked porcelain doll. But Jamie's voice shattered her reverie. Lottie, look what I found. Jamie's voice seemed to break through pur purposeful silence, and Charlotte flinched but made her way over to look. At Jamie's feet was an old and worn suitcase, or that's what it looked like. But when Jamie energetically unbuckled the top and opened it, a tiny little stationery set was revealed. Charlotte immediately fell to her knees, an excited gasp escaping her lips. Charlotte looked over the two sets of stationery. It was still full, which surprised her. Who wouldn't use such a treasure? There were dark feather pens, small ink bottles, envelopes, aging paper, and even seal stamps with black wax. Charlotte turned to Jamie and said excitedly, we have to get this. A smile grew on Jamie's face. He couldn't say no to Charlotte when she got excited like this. So he hefted the, sevi the heavy stationery setup and walked to the register. He paid, giving a sly look at Charlotte, who wasn't paying attention. It was hard for him to treat her. She always denied his gentlemanly offers at paying for things. He smiled slightly to himself, satisfied with getting away with this. But his smile quickly disappeared when he saw the price. He gave another look at Charlotte. She was worth this ridiculously expensive price and more. He gave his credit card to the man at the register and swallowed hard. He was going to get yelled at for spending so much money, but he would survive. As Charlotte and Jamie walked out of the store, Charlotte's face lit up with an idea. She started to bounce as she walked beside him, her energy practically glowing from the tips of her hair to the edge of her shoes. Jamie smiled as she immediately began talking. We should write each other letters over the summer with the stationery set. It would be fun. Charlotte was excited again. Her eyes practically sparkled with what sparkled as she looked at him hopefully. Jamie couldn't say no, not even if he'd wanted to. His smile widened because he thought it was a good idea too. Let's do it. The next morning, Jamie left for Florida until mid-August. Charlotte didn't get to see him before he left, but both were okay with that. They had said their goodbyes the night before, and although they knew they would miss each other, they believed that their love for each other would survive a couple of months of separation. Jamie looked out the plane window. They were above the clouds now. All he could see was the blue sky and the endless clouds all around. They almost appeared to be a lumpy and overly plush ground. They were a fantasy land. He wanted to picture himself walking on them. But as he thought of the wonder of that experience, he thought of a letter he stayed up late writing for Charlotte the night before. He had taken out a stationery set and started writing something right away. Jamie didn't think he was the best writer, but he wanted to write something special for Charlotte. So he wrote a story, one of the life he wanted to give her. For Jamie wasn't like most boys his age. He was tender at heart and treasured Charlotte so dearly he felt no shame in loving her openly. He made Charlotte a princess, living in a grand castle. She had everything she wanted in their kingdom. She would spend hours in the garden he made for her. He would she would love the people they ruled over, and her love and kindness would brighten the kingdom. Jamie fiddled with the necklace he found inside his half of the stationery set. 
He hadn't asked Charlotte if she'd had one. He was afraid her half didn't have one, so he didn't say anything. But he found the key to be like a reminder. Whenever he felt his cool metal against his skin, he thought of Charlotte. He felt that having a reminder while so far away from her would make him feel better. Charlotte, who was miles below him, was wearing her own necklace. She had almost asked him if he had his own, but she too was afraid he might not have one. So she stayed silent. A few days later, Charlotte's mother brought in the mail and gave her a letter. Charlotte hadn't written her, her letter yet. She'd wanted to, but she was almost scared to upset the tidy stationery set she had set up so nicely in her room. She looked at the letter curiously, the wax seal catching her attention. The black wax was stamped in the shape of a lock. Her hand immediately moved to rest over the necklace. The key finally made sense. It really was a part of the set. She smiled softly to herself and put the key to the lock to pretend to open it. She admired the creativity of it all. But as the key came near the wax seal, it changed, and suddenly it was real. Charlotte gasped silently as the key slid into the letter, just as it would in any other case. She looked at it from all angles, shocked. She couldn't make sense of it. it didn't, she didn't understand how it worked. But after a few minutes, she bit her bottom lip and turned the key. And as soon as she did so, the world around her faded. Suddenly, she was in what appeared to be a castle, and Jamie was there too. She ran to him surprised. He smiled at her, looking very handsome in what looked like some medieval clothes. She noticed her clothes were different too. They matched his. Charlotte started to ask Jamie what was going on. He seemed calm and sure here. He told her that this was the world he wanted for her, where she had everything she wanted. Charlotte looked through the stunning gardens, met the people of the kingdom, and loved all of it. It was grand and beautiful, and everything seemed to glow with the vibrancy of life. They spent hours roaming the palace grounds, finding endless things to enjoy. Then suddenly, Jamie turned to her, and he said, I love you, Charlotte. Yours truly, Jamie. The world around her vanished, and Charlotte found herself standing in her kitchen with Jamie's letter now unfolded in her hands. At the very bottom of the page, written in Jamie's messy handwriting was, I love you, Charlotte. Yours truly, Jamie. Charlotte felt her breath coming quickly in and out. Her mind was bewildered, mixed, and confused. It wasn't sure what to make of what had just happened. She put the letter back in the envelope, but it was just an ordinary letter now. She was left thinking that it was just her imagination. She must be crazy. That made more sense than what was happening. But either way, she ran to her room and started writing a letter for Jamie. She filled it with everything she would have loved to experience with him. They visited grand places. They walked on water. They flew in the sky. She put extraordinary experiences on paper. She didn't care that if this all indeed was a dream, Jamie would be met with confusion. She was taking the chance that it was real. She wanted to give Jamie adventure. Almost a week later, Jamie got a letter in Florida. He smiled softly, just like Charlotte, and pretended to put his key in the lock. His surprise was practically identical to hers, but he twisted his key, his curiosity getting the best of him. His world fell away and immediately he was transported to the edge of the ocean. Charlotte was there. She looked stunning in a white dress, her hair falling down her back softly. She smiled, she smiled at him, her eyes sparkling with unknown knowledge, and she stepped out on the water. Jamie watched as her feet remained on the surface. How was she doing that? She extended her arm, the smile on her face shining so brightly it shouldn't have been humanly possible. He took her hand as she led him onto the water. His feet remained above the surface as well. He laughed and pulled Charlotte out farther with him. Slowly the scenes changed and they were flying. Then they were in large meadows, towering mountains, grand waterfalls, and never-ending deserts. Then suddenly Charlotte turned to him, her, eyes, her shining eyes somehow calm. I hope you had fun, Jamie. Always and forever yours, Charlotte. The world fell away and Jamie was back in Florida. He dropped the papers in his hands and stared at them for a long period of time for where they lay on the ground. He was shocked beyond belief. That was magic. It had to be. He had a magic stationery set. They had a magic stationery set. He picked up the papers and ran inside his house. Jamie sat down and began writing. He wrote as fast as he could, putting his own dreams on the very pages. He wanted them to be real for Charlotte. He knew that if she wrote such adventures in her letter, 
and she had already experienced the kingdom he had made for her. He wanted to create so much more for her, so he did. Charlotte and Jamie would exchange the letters back and forth. They never ran out of ideas. There was always something to find, somewhere to go. But the letters made them forget really about each other. Their lives outside of each other became distant. The other didn't really know what was happening in the other's lives. Charlotte never wrote to Jamie about her sick grandma who was dying. Jamie never told Charlotte about the fights his parents were starting to have. They didn't tell each other about the things they really did the places they really did go, or what was really happening. The letter's world consumed them. But it all came crashing down when Charlotte's grandma died. Jamie came back to Minnesota the next day. Charlotte wasn't at the airport. She wasn't anywhere to surprise him. He drove to her house, and when he got there, he found Charlotte and her family a wreck. Charlotte's face was puffy and red, and she looked awful. The girl in the letters flashed in Jamie's eyes. He barely recognized Charlotte in this real state. Jamie himself didn't look well. His parents had been arguing with each other more and more. He hadn't gotten any sleep for almost two days now. Dark rings formed under his eyes, and he looked tired and sick. Charlotte didn't see the handsome and beaming Jamie from their letters. They looked at each other and were withdrawn. They barely knew the other anymore. But as they stood looking at each other, the truth dawned on both of them. They had been so caught up in this imaginary world, they had forgotten about the real one. They hugged each other tightly, and this hug was different than any they shared in their letters. It was much more raw and true. As time wore on, Jamie and Charlotte put the stationary sets away. They focused on what was really happening in their lives. Charlotte started to spend more time with her family and made a little space in honor of her grandma in her room. Jamie talked with his parents, and even though they were talking about divorcing, they were more mindful not only of each other, but of Jamie's face as well. They decided to live in the moment. They recognized that dreams and the worlds they created were beautiful and fantastical, but the world, they, the world they lived in was real and true and entirely present. The letters taught them to live for and in each moment. Although the world that Jamie and Charlotte chose to live in wasn't as full of wonder, they loved it even more because it was real. It was open for them to share. And what they liked most was that it wasn't locked away with a key. Thank you so much. All right, and in the grades 11 and 12 in this category, we'll begin with honorable mention. Um, is Lucy Fleming here? Oh, yay, okay. So uh, please join me in congratulating Lucy Fleming for facial feedback theory. Amazing boots. Honorable mention for those as well. <laughs> um, and the Award of Merit, please join me in congratulating Sophia Cruz von Busicom for Coffee Shop. And for the Award of Excellence, um, unfortunately, I believe Kaylee is not here tonight. Um, they let us know they could not come, um, but let's please give a warm round of applause for Kaylee Nikish for Golden Hearts Turn Silver. All right, uh, we're ending the night with our newest category, uh, which just debuted this year, Spoken Word. Um, we have one winner in this category. The number of entries was a bit low because it is so new to this contest, but we were very inspired by the work that um, was submitted and excited to see it grow. So tell your friends that spoken word is now a category in the Right Now High School Writing Contest. 
Um, and luckily, we have a really lovely message from um, spoken word judge Amber Gutbier. Um, and I, I love this message, and it's a nice one to um, end the award ceremony with. She says, being a writer is not just a little something you do. It is something that you are. Writing is not only a necessary form of art, it is a critical one. Writers shape, recreate, and represent the world around them. Whether that's as journalists or poets, writing fiction or non, writers inspire, invoke, anger, excite, insight, and ignite. Each one of you embodies the best of what writing can be, and while you will all no doubt be and do many wonderful things in the world, you will always have the soul of a writer. Congratulations. Um, well, yeah, for all the writers, thank you. The winner in this category has been recognized many times tonight, so join me one more time in congratulating Ariana Van Cook for her spoken word piece, Award of Excellence winning poem, Seldom But a Girl. All right, well, thank you to all of you for coming out to attend this night, celebrating these amazing young writers. Please know that all of the award-winning entries will be published on our website, um, and you are all encouraged to read them all because they are incredible. Um, so please check that out. That will be up um, over the next couple of days. And I also want to make an exciting announcement that we're debuting this year. These students' work will also be published in White Bear Center for the Arts' new literary magazine, which will be launched this fall. Um, so this publication will feature all the award winners' work, as well as selected pieces from all of the contest submissions. So it's really an amazing opportunity to see what local writers are writing about and really experience the amount of talent um, that we have in our communities with our young writers. Um, so watch this space for more information on that. Uh, that will be the fall. And since we're celebrating young artists, I can't recommend enough that you take a look at the High School Visual Arts Contest exhibition while you're here in the gallery. Um, so we'll have some refreshments. You're welcome to mingle, look at art, congratulate each other. And we hope that you enjoy this evening and that you come back soon. We have catalogs at the front desk with all of our amazing gallery exhibitions and upcoming arts programs. So please take a look at that and really just bask in what you've accomplished tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and thanks for being here. Congratulations. Congratulations.